Welcome to the U.S.-China Global Education Television Series, presented by the Confucius Institute, U.S. Center, in partnership with the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. This 10-part series brings together presidents of universities and cultural institutions that host the Confucius Institute, along with distinguished American business, diplomatic, and educational leaders to discuss the importance of global education, language development, and people-to-people -people exchange between the United States and China. My name is Tony Cully Foster, and I'm the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Our focus is on global education, international affairs, and global communications. Like the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, we build educational bridges and advance international understanding between students, teachers, and professionals in the United States, China, and worldwide. We have a valued strategic partnership with the Confucius Institute, U.S. Center. Their focus is on Chinese language development, global education, and people-to-people -people exchanges between the United States and China. It's my honor today to be here with my friend and colleague, Professor Gao Qing, the Executive Director of the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, who will introduce our program today. Thank you, Tony. Today's program takes place at the National Press Club and features two distinguished speakers, Dr. W. Taylor Reveille III, President of the College of William Mary, and Dr. Ethel Bremer, CEO of NAFSA Association of International Educators. Dr. Reveille is the 27th president of the College of William and Mary, the second oldest college in the nation and a distinguished public research university. Dr. Reveille is a global leader in education and an expert in the field of law. He has served on the boards of many prominent educational and cultural organizations. He received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his law degree from the University of Virginia. Under his leadership, the Confucius Institute at William & Mary has become a very active and a vibrant part of the campus that serves communities across Williamburg. Dr. Ethel Bremer is the CEO of NAFSA Association of International Educators, which is one of the largest nonprofit organizations dedicated to global education, serving over 10,000 educators and 3,000 higher educational institutions worldwide. Dr. Bremer has served three distinguished appointments within the U.S. Department of State and in many international affairs think tanks. He is a distinguished expert in global education, international affairs, multilateralism, and peacekeeping. Now, let's join Dr. Reveille and Dr. Bremer for this important dialogue. Professor Gao, thank you very much. It's quite wonderful to be here. My name is Taylor Reveille from William & Mary, and it's all of our good fortune to have Dr. Esther Brimmer with us. I'm looking forward to quite a delightful conversation with her. Let me tell you first just a bit about Dr. Brimmer. She has had a very distinguished career as a public servant, as a teacher. She served in the U.S. Department of State on three separate occasions in senior posts most recently as the Assistant Secretary for International Organization Affairs. She's taught at John Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. She's written several books and articles. And since January of this year, she's been the Chief Executive Officer, the Supreme Being of NAFSA, the Association of International Educators. Dr. Bremer got her PhD at Oxford University. Dr. Bremer, how about 
giving us just a sketch of your own journey in global mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. touching on experiences in China and the United States, and then tell us a little bit about NAFSA mm -hmm. and what its mission is. President Rivoli, it's so nice to be here with you and I look forward to our conversation. I'm delighted to be a part of this series sponsored by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., and the Confucius Institute. This is an exciting time to be talking about international education. And indeed, both professionally and personally, I've benefited from international education. I must say that I've had a chance to travel. I was fortunate to travel when I was growing up with my parents. Uh, my father was actually a Fulbright Scholar in 1951 um, in India. And so I heard about the importance of international education from a very early age. In my own life, I had a chance to study in Switzerland. And given my lifelong interest in international organizations, they turned out to be truly beneficial. Years later, I had an opportunity to work on international relations issues. And indeed, my copy of the United Nations Charter that I carried with me my entire time when I led US policy at the United Nations dated back to my days as an international student. That dog-eared copy had been with me ever since my days. Now that is quite wonderful. So indeed, the chance to study, uh, study internationally is, is special. But actually, international education can occur right at home as well. That as universities make a greater commitment to bringing ideas from around the world to their campus to enhance education and research, they're helping students everywhere, whether they travel or not, benefit from international ideas and appreciate the importance of international cooperation. NAFSA. Mm. NAFSA, and I will let you in on what the actual acronym stands for. NASA I looked it up on Google and it's, it's interesting. NASA was founded in 1948 as the National Association of Foreign Student Advisors. From the very beginning, NAFSAs have been dedicated to welcoming international students and scholars to the United States. And the initial group who were welcoming 25,000 students who were coming to the United States in the 1940s thought it would be a good idea to be in touch with their colleagues who were also welcoming international students. That core mission is still very much at the heart of the work of NAFSA. Our full name is now NAFSA, the Association of International Educators. But we still are very much dedicated to enhancing and supporting international education and the men and women around the world who make it happen. Well, NAFSA and William and Mary have a lot in common, especially in terms of our longstanding commitments to comprehensive international education. Uh, please share with us your thoughts about what internationalization is, why it matters, and why it matters also that it be comprehensive. What are your thoughts on all that? Indeed, internationalization, of course, is a long and complicated word that actually helps us think about an important strategy for enhancing research and educational opportunities. What we're looking at particularly are efforts by institutions, colleges and universities, to bring together best thinking uh, to benefit their students. And that means bringing into the classroom opportunities to think about, work with students and scholars in other countries, and to enhance research opportunities. But it's important that we have a, as a comprehensive internationalization, which means an institutional commitment to look across the board in many different parts of the university about how to bring together uh, global learning. Therefore, on a, a campus, I know each campus has its own interpretation, of course, William and Mary has been leading in this area. But in most campuses, you'll see a commitment by senior leadership, including presidents and provosts, and from senior international officers, as well as from the faculty. So you will often need the commitment of the administration, of the faculty, and those officers who actually run student services or international programs. One aspect might be mobility, bringing students and scholars uh, into the United States or uh, having them travel abroad. But it's really the importance of a comprehensive strategy that looks at how to bring these ideas to the campus. A particularly important aspect is something that goes by the term internationalization at home. That means looking at ways to make sure that students who may not have the opportunity for education abroad, 
benefit from the insights uh, that can be brought into the classroom, that can be brought into partnerships, so that students are, have a chance at global learning, even if they don't have a chance to leave their home country. That is crucially important, because mm -hmm. not every student does have the mm -hmm. opportunity to go abroad and study, sometimes limited by their finances. Um, so you do have to bring it to them on campus, mm -hmm. as well as hope that most of your students can spend a year, a term, a summer abroad studying. And the comprehensive element is also crucial. Mm -hmm. And that does take leadership mm -hmm. from the top to get international emphasis across the university in all of its baronies, all of its bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. So NASA's encouragement in that regard is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, NASA's work involves fostering a global community. Can you explain your view of what this, what this means mm -hmm. And do you think China and, and the United States have particularly important roles in fostering a global community? From my view, uh, the global community idea talks about a sense, a network of people, institutions, and countries that care about trying to have greater understanding amongst themselves, who see the efforts in trying to understand each other's cultures and histories as part of an effort for managing international affairs in a peaceful and a harmonious way while um, advancing human well-being. It suggests that we all have a stake in understanding our societies and that we all bear some responsibility for trying to enhance uh, human well-being and that that is through international politics, international law, culture, society, many different aspects. Governments and non-governmental institutions are all part of shaping and leading uh, a global community. I would suggest that many, many countries have important roles to play in contributing to human well-being. The United States and China both can do so uh, given their commitment to education and the efforts that many people, whether in colleges, universities, in a variety of different settings, uh, are making to try to advance a greater sense of community. But it does start off with a sense of seeking understanding and respect. Yes. And it's hard to Im imagine a really vibrant global community these mm. days unless the, both the United mm. States and China are involved in it. Mm. Well, how has global education enhanced and benefited your career and in the process of being globally mm -hmm. educated? Were there times when you feel your own understanding of the world, your own world view shifted mm -hmm. some, evolved? because of global education. Indeed, I, I'm very thankful. I've been very fortunate to be able to benefit from international education. In my junior year as an undergraduate, I was able to study in Geneva at the Graduate Institute for International Affairs and to study uh, uh, international affairs. And I did my graduate work in the United Kingdom, both my master's and doctorate at, at Oxford. I was very fortunate to be able to have these opportunities. And I might draw on two experiences. Indeed, sometimes uh, the impact of international affairs is, and uh, sometimes the impact of uh, international study hits you in particular moments. One, from my experience in Geneva, um, I was an undergraduate sitting in on graduate classes. And what was exciting to see was the bilingual classroom. In other words, uh, at the institute you could speak English or French. Uh, and it meant that not only could you speak English or French if you're, as you chose, you could speak both in the same class. So the professor might pose a question in French you could answer in English, it could be posed in English, you could answer in French, and students could uh, speak either. And it was, of course, very impressive to watch those who, were, who had great facility in both, and while my French was reasonable, I was impressed by those around me. And it brought home the importance of being able to be comfortable in a variety of languages yeah. and to try to learn with your, your fellows, our uh, fellow students, about languages. A different experience is the importance of geography. And here I would say that um, you find experiences that remind you how close we are. Now, I am old enough to have been a graduate student in the middle of the 1980s. 
You were still a child. Oh, no, no, no. And, uh, and indeed, I will call the spring of 1986 was when, unfortunately, the world experienced the Chernobyl disaster. Yeah. I was in the United Kingdom in that time, in addition to the serious loss of life at the actual site. There was also concern about the health effects of those downwind. Yeah. And there literally uh, was tracking every day of where the cloud was. And I can remember being in the United Kingdom and people saying, you probably should stay inside. The cloud is over the UK yeah. today. It's very sobering. It reminds you how close all of us really are. International education really can transform the perspectives mm -hmm. of students, particularly those mm -hmm. who haven't had the sort of opportunities mm -hmm. you had to travel abroad while mm -hmm. with your parents mm -hmm. while still very young. Traveling and studying, staying long enough, mm -hmm to really immerse themselves in the culture of another country can have a profound impact on kids' lives and on how they see themselves and their country in the world. You have taught at three different universities. You've been a professor in many classrooms. How have you engaged things international in your classrooms? How have you drawn international students, American students, into a, a meaningful conversation with one another. In short, just how has it gone? Mm. How have you made it work? Mm. What have you gotten out of it? What do you think the students have gotten mm -hmm. out of it? Well, I've been very fortunate. I've had the opportunity to be a professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., at uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, also in Washington, D.C., and the College of Europe in Bruges, Belgium. And I've had a wonderful opportunity to teach students from so many different countries in these different institutions. And indeed, of course, you always learn from your students. So for example, while I was at the College of Europe, and that was quite a, uh, an interesting experience because the College of Europe has what they call the flying faculty, and we literally were. So while I was on the faculty at Johns Hopkins Sice, I was also on the faculty at the College of Europe. And we'd go back and forth between uh, the two institutions. And so as many, uh, as many uh, uh, professors know, you teach uh, at the master's degree level maybe a seminar a week. Well, we would do a whole seminar, a whole semester in two weeks. So you would Good rather Lord. so you, yeah, you so I would fly and teach every day. So every day was as if it were a week. And so the students did a wonderful job of actually having to do the readings in advance. And then I would prepare the lectures and do all of the lecturing as well as the advising and reviewing the papers. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. I'm surprised you yeah. survived. Oh uh, well, unfortunately, I like to fly, so it was, it was good. And the students were fabulous. But it was a real education because here the College of Europe was designed as an institution for students from many countries. And indeed, um, uh, when I arrived at that point, the uh, European Union was planning to create the European Union External Action Service, in effect, a European Union Foreign Service. And they created a new degree, uh, the, uh, a master's uh, in international relations and diplomacy. And so I taught the transatlantic course. So they had people from different regions of the world teaching their regions of the world. So I can't complain because our colleagues who were coming from the Pacific had a lot farther to fly. But what was interesting to me, for example, in this context was to compare the first year and the second year. Because the first year, um, because you're getting used to, to, uh, to your students and the structure of the class, and many of the students were very knowledgeable already um, in transatlantic issues. They have wonderful students who, have, who studied uh, in depth. Interestingly, the second year, um, the European Union was able to provide additional scholarships to students from Eastern Europe and from beyond, which was wonderful. It meant more students were able to participate. You had more students in the classroom. But I realized that I, as a professor, had to think about what was the knowledge base and background of the different students in yeah. the class. I could not start a, a course on transatlantic relations, immediately jump into the nuances of the European Union and the debate of diplomacy negotiations with Washington. I had to step back and talk about institutions. So for example, to try to explain uh, to an international audience more about our three branches of government the checks and balances system. If you're talking about American foreign policy, you, you need to be able to talk about the executive and the legislative branches, and occasionally the judicial, the judicial branch as well, in order to begin to talk about um, how, uh, uh, how, to, uh, how these uh, elements affect transatlantic relations. And so I think it means that, uh, that as faculty members, we have to think about how do we understand where each student is 
and how do we help them gain the knowledge base so that they can really benefit um, from uh, the classroom situation. Now I found also similarly keeping that experience helped enlighten some of the, the choices I made in arranging a curriculum well, later on when I was teaching at uh, George Washington U University's uh, Elliott School. Because again, I wanted to find ways to bring students together. So for example, we've talked about the importance of international education and uh, the international education bringing new ideas into the classroom. And so one of the things I wanted to look at was how can I make sure that I'm giving all students even those for whom English may be a second or third language, a way to engage in the classroom. So I thought we'd both work on ways to bring students together directly and use the technology to our advantage. There were two different ways that, to do that here as examples. One was I would set a project where students had to do an oral presentation. In other words, they had to stand up in front of the classroom and the grade was designed, and they had to have a written component as well. The written component, they were great on the written component individually, but they were graded together on the oral presentation. In other words, each one depended on the other one for success. And I would look to see, did it look like they actually had a real team? Did they share out the work? Had they made sure that they were under uh, that they everybody in the team understood what uh, what the material covered? Did they really teach each other? Because that's the most powerful is when you see students who probably wouldn't have met each other otherwise in your class working on a project together, and that together they're advancing knowledge. That's when you say teamwork can help. Yeah, it can help. It can help. Given all of your experiences and your significant accomplishments. What knowledge and what skills would you say are most valuable for students and young professionals, people who've recently completed their educations? What knowledge, what skills do they really need to have these days mm -hmm. in order to succeed in a global community? Mm -hmm. I might talk about, this is probably Esther's list, uh, what I might talk about certain enduring skills perhaps. Uh, I, I would start off with a, uh, sorry, I would start off with an, a knowledge of history. I think it is worth whatever region of the world you're interested in is reading history and something that's a lifelong uh, interest so that you have greater insights into the societies where you're spending time, whether for work, travel, or for other reasons. The importance of geography, again, trying to understand uh, literally the lay of the land, but the impact of population, environment, uh, and other issues that affect the, uh, human life on the planet. And I, actually, I'd put in a bid for literature. Now, there are many different types, but I'll say that uh, when I was still traveling for the State Department, I used to ask ambassadors, what's your favorite novel about the country where you're serving? You know, it's what is the way to get into the mind of somebody else? It may be poetry, it may be, uh, it may be different avenues. I happen to like novels, so that was always my question. So I think those are enduring. And then in terms of skills, I think whatever profession, whether in the sciences, law, business, whatever, that a willingness to listen and an ability to appreciate other cultures. That is where, particularly where, again, global learning helps us understand the views of others and the motivations of others so that we can try to work more closely at greater understanding. And those skills are important throughout one's life. So irrespective of whatever new technology we have, and I do like technology, I really do, uh, that uh, there are certain human skills that I think will continue to be important, and those are enhanced by international learning. And they're important whether you're at home or abroad. They certainly uh, are. Including, as you were saying, mm -hmm. a comfort mm -hmm. with people and cultures different, a desire to understand them, to appreciate mm -hmm. them, not to shrink from them. Mm -hmm. Global mm -hmm. education can really help in those respects. People want jobs. Mm -hmm once they finish school. Mm -hmm. And jobs do provide a great deal of me meaning for people's mm -hmm. lives. But to get a job, you've got to present yourself mm -hmm. with the qualities that an employer is seeking. And I think employers are quite fastidious these days about what they are seeking, particularly for the more sophisticated jobs. Uh, what in your experience 
do contemporary employers really value the most when evaluating candidates, particularly students who've recently graduated from college or graduate school or professional school? What are employers looking for, do you think? Indeed, employers are eager to have new employees who have international experience, whether gained through education abroad or from benefiting from internationalization at home. That indeed we have seen that the international skills and the, that we have seen that the experience with international affairs is important to employers. For example, in a 2015 Pew Research Center survey noted that the group of employers that they had uh, surveyed saw the importance of students who had a cross-cultural understanding that enabled them to work with everybody else on their team and wanted people who were able to function well in unfamiliar circumstances. These are skills that one often has acquired by being able to experience unfamiliar uh, settings and being able to succeed in them. Employers, interestingly enough, are also interested not only in their senior managers having these international skills, but increasingly we're seeing surveys that highlight the need at all levels of employment for an understanding of the world at large. Yeah. That <coughs> whether you are uh, working in customer service, um, you're working on building relationships with your suppliers, a wide variety of jobs need to be able to understand the world beyond your doorstep. And employers increasingly are looking for people who have had those experiences, who have the habits of interaction, often gained from international study, that enable people to succeed in teams when they walk through the door. So we're seeing that employers are eager to have the globally prepared workforce. That's good for companies. That's good for countries. And so we see that I think many members of the international business community also see benefits as well. In addition, I think um, many communities are benefiting from the international efforts of our colleges and, and universities. That precisely because colleges and universities are part of the communities in which they live, that the efforts they're making at internationalization at home also bring benefits to their immediate communities yeah. in terms of outreach and others. So many, many people, many, many layers of people close and farther away from our, from our campuses are benefiting from these increase in, in, increase in international links. You know, we need good citizens and successful leaders desperately. We need them in the United States. We need them in China. We need them everywhere. NAFSA emphasizes thought leadership. Can you tell us what that means and how that bears on growing more good citizens and effective leaders? Indeed, NAFSA likes to support thought leadership uh, in support of its members. We try to support research in areas that will benefit their work in uh, fostering, uh, fostering work between international students and scholars. So that we try to look at both who is writing interesting articles, addressing uh, the important nuances of creating greater cooperation uh, between uh, universities and building those sense of mutual understanding. And specifically, are there habits of interaction, particular programs that have worked well? As I said, NAFSA began first with the so, so advisors welcoming international students. What are the best practices in those areas? How can we help institutions uh, understand uh, the best ways uh, to help students maybe get to uh, learn how to work in new settings, how to be in unfamiliar settings? Uh, those exchange of knowledge amongst our members is something we like to encourage. We also like to make sure that people are able to have access to ideas from a wide variety of professions. So we look at what are the interesting things going on in economics, in history, and other areas that help influence international education. And again, help people think both what's the cutting edge new thinking about, let's say, bringing a mutual cooperation into a classroom or using new technologies between campuses, but how does that reinforce the age-old efforts to have academic rigor uh, and advanced learning in a structured way. So we try to make sure that there's a wide variety of information available and that we support whether it's through magazines, through our own research, through our scholarly journals, work that helps advance international education. That is a rich diet of mm. endeavors. Mm. And the more, I believe, it can be sharply focused mm. 
on good citizenship, mm. good global mm. citizenship, and effective leadership, more significant it will prove to be. The purpose of the Confucius Institute mm. is to provide Chinese language, Mandarin, cross-cultural awareness, and global education programs between China and the United States. What, in your view, is the importance of language study across countries mm -hmm. and cross-cultural awareness? Mm -hmm. Just how much does all that matter in mm -hmm. the real world? Mm -hmm. I think language study is very important, and of course the Confucius Institute and its many partners across the U.S. work particularly on uh, Chinese language and particularly on Mandarin language. But I would suggest that the, the study of language I think is particularly important because by learning languages we learn both not only literal words but nuance, understanding and insights into how other people think. And so that therefore uh, learning languages can enrich our understanding of other societies but also can be very specific as well that um, in particular uh, jobs you need to be able to understand how to communicate with your, your colleagues, how to communicate with your customers, how to communicate um, with uh, the people with whom you're working. And I've found that um, often, even just working between English and French, trying to capture the nuance um, is often a very subtle art. And being able to work with your colleagues to actually put together the contract that actually meets what you need is very important. And so the language study is, is important. And we all know that to the extent that we can learn languages early in life, that also helps Sooner us. Sooner the better. Yeah, and, and uh, as I'm always reminding, as I think you do as well, our students, uh, that to have the opportunity um, to be able to do that for rigorous study, and particularly since it may take many years to acquire proficiency, to be able to do that in a, in a structured way early in life may enhance the long-term ability to use the language in, in one's professional and personal life. So that's very important, as is the And element. once you learn it, mm -hmm. stick with it. Keep yes. using it. Yes. Other way, mm. otherwise, it mm. is going to slip mm. away on little mm. cat's feet mm. very quickly. Indeed, you are right. And this is where, going back to technology, where technology can help us. It's most important, of course, to talk to people, but the opportunity, for example, to listen, to yeah. be able to tune into a website and hear the language that you that you say spoken regularly. Uh, people find that they'll they'll find whether the radio station or the website that allows them to do it, or a variety of other tools that can help them in between, if they don't have the opportunity to actually do the best thing, which is yeah. talking to somebody else. So, but so we use all of those tools. I think are, are I think are important. And it's one thing to be able to mm. order dinner mm. in another language mm. than your first language. Mm quite another to be able to negotiate effectively mm. in another mm. language. Mm. And uh, those people mm. well, who are able to speak another mm. language or two mm. with great efficacy have a huge comparative advantage mm. these days. Mm. And I think that comparative advantage mm. is just going to keep getting mm. bigger and bigger. Mm. What about cross-cultural awareness? Mm. Mm. I think cross-cultural awareness is very important in a variety of settings. Of course, within one's own country, that being able to understand people from all over the country is yeah. extremely important. And again, the skills of being able to talk to someone whose background may be different, experiences may be different, is extremely important. And indeed, that the, the opportunity- And to want to talk to them. Indeed, it, indeed, indeed. It is a, an attitude and an approach. And, how, and uh, one of the many benefits of having international students in one's own country is the opportunity to get to know people from other societies from many countries in settings where you can build relationships over time. And so that students get to work together on a project. They may live together in the same dorm. That they find that they're able to build solid, hopefully lifelong friendships yeah. that give them insights into other societies. And indeed, uh, our colleges and universities provide such a rich, welcoming environment for that type of interaction. It's really, really very special. Mm. And when global education mm. is really hitting on all cylinders, mm -hmm. That's one of mm. its primal advantages, I think, mm. cross-cultural awareness. Well, let's think specifically about China and the United States. What are your thoughts, Dr. Mm. Bremer, about 
the value of higher education mm -hmm. exchanges between people from China and people from the United mm -hmm. States, whether we're talking about students, professors, mm -hmm. researchers. Mm -hmm. Indeed. The exchange of students and scholars is so important to the relationship between the United States and China. And indeed, we see great opportunities for further cooperation in this area and think that it's very beneficial to see the flow of students and scholars between both countries. As you know, China sends the largest group of students to the United States e each year. Up over one million international students study in the United States. Of those, about half come from China or from India. At this point, there are over 328,000 Chinese students uh, studying in the United States in the 2015-2016 mm, uh, academic year. And so that's an important connection between the two countries. Good group of those, about 135,000 are undergraduates, but 123,000 of those are graduates. Yeah. And there are a mix of other types of students as well. Now, one area um, that we'd like to uh, increase is the number of Americans who study in China. Over 12,000 students, American students, study in China. We'd like to see more students have the opportunity to study um, in China and to study internationally generally, that to make those opportunities available. So indeed, the exchange of students and sc scholars is very important. We see scope for trying to expand those exchanges, and the exchange of students and scholars is an important part of the relationship between the United States and China. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and you put your finger on mm -hmm. an area in which we do need to improve those of us mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States. More American students mm -hmm. need to be going to China mm -hmm. to study. And of course, one of the, th the inhibitions, I think, on that has been that we have so relatively few American students who are fluent in Mandarin, mm -hmm. are willing to tackle it mm -hmm. in China. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese have done so much better job about mm -hmm. teaching their kids English. Mm -hmm. And they're able to come over and mm -hmm. take instruction mm -hmm. in this country in, in English. Mm -hmm. But certainly the exchange of students and professors and researchers uh, between William and Mary and Chinese universities, mm -hmm. very important to us at William and Mary. A and we delight in our numerous Chinese students mm -hmm. and professors and researchers who come mm -hmm. to our campus each year. Do you have any advice for those of us involved with the Confucius Institute programs, mm -hmm. the network in this country? about how we might do better, how we might expand the potential for immersion in Mandarin that comes with mm -hmm. Confucius Institutes and the cultural exchange and the, the global education programs. Mm -hmm. It's already flourishing. Mm -hmm. How could we make it mm -hmm. thrive even more? One of the di distinctive features, as you know, is that each partnership um, is based on the needs of the universities involved. And so in a sense, each partnership will look a bit different depending on what each university needs. And, and one of the important elements is the ability to examine closely uh, what the partners need and how they might expand uh, the partnership. So therefore, there isn't one single solution that will fit all over 100 relationships. But I would suggest that the ability to, to uh, learn from what's been done, to look at uh, ways to further access to language study and cross-cultural learning, to broaden the ability of, uh, of people to participate uh, in uh, these types of exchanges uh, would be important. To, as we've indicated, that uh, it would be helpful for more people to be able to benefit from learning languages and from cultural exchange. So I think each institution understanding what the needs of its own students would be should be the real driving uh, driving factor. And that will look different on each campus. It will l look different on each campus. There probably it is some real potential to, for the various Confucius Institutes across mm -hmm. the United States to learn from one another, mm -hmm. to see what has worked well mm -hmm. at University X, what hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and there probably could be a closer network of mm -hmm. the, the universities that are involved with Confucius Institutes in this country mm -hmm. than we have yet. Um, 
we can always learn from one another, mm -hmm. both from our successes and our, and our mm -hmm. failures. As we all know, the United States in recent months has, has undergone a good bit of political change, mm -hmm. good bit of political excitement, mm -hmm. some uh, change of course internationally, and I think this has led some people, particularly some people abroad, to wonder about just how committed the United States will be to global education, to cross-cultural awareness uh, going forward. So putting on your uh, prognostication hat, what do you think the future holds for America mm. and global involvement, in particular global education? These have been turbulent times, and colleges and universities have had to try to deal with the world around them. Yes. And I would suggest, indeed, uh, uh, and I would suggest that some of the changes have created a great deal of uncertainty, as suggested by your question, that many inside and outside the United States are asking, is there an ongoing commitment to international education? I would yeah. say yes. We have been quite struck by the response we've seen, certainly from our NAFSA members, who have made extraordinary efforts to demonstrate that they want to continue to welcome international students and scholars to their campuses. Universities, large and small, across the country have reached out to students and said, you are welcome here. You are welcome on, on our campus. We care about global le learning. We want you to be part of our community. And I think that's a very powerful message. And I hope that people internationally continue to hear that Americans want to welcome their their scholars and students to this country. I think that will persist despite what's going on in, a, in the larger world beyond, a, beyond the campus. I think there'll be continued interest in international education and learning from each other that will persist. The other aspect was to try to think about how do we think about class participation. Now, in, uh, in the United States, we're used to our, uh, we encourage our students to speak up, raise their hands, challenge the professor. Many societies would have a, have a different approach, and so that most would have a different indeed. approach. Indeed, and so students may know the material very well, but not always feel comfortable raising their hands. And we try to work on that, encourage people to be very much be part of the discussion, so that everybody heard what what the student had to say. But this is where I found that the online aspects of class could be useful as well. So I would, uh, in addition to the regular readings in class and the written assignments that students also had to post a comment each week. They had to pull something from the news and they had to uh, comment on the reading. One, we assured they did the reading, but it meant that for some students, that was their opportunity to take the time to write in their second or third language a thoughtful commentary on the reading. And to speak up. Yes, and then everyone else had to read that and be aware of what their fellow students had said. And I found both the, that process meant that people for whom, again, languages, uh, there was a learning, uh, let's say their second or third language, could excel. And I found the news stories were interesting because you often found, I would encourage students to look at whatever news source they liked from whatever language they liked. And so they would bring that with, uh, within the classroom. So many professors found many different ways to try to make sure that students from every country uh, feel welcome in their classroom and that we find ways to open the channels, to encourage students to help teach each other. One area, era that I think is particularly mm -hmm. challenging often for teachers and for students is when students wish to disagree with one another, mm -hmm. particularly if one student wishes to express what he or she believes to be a minority opinion. Mm -hmm. How did you help the kids mm -hmm. become willing mm -hmm. in a very substantive and civil fashion mm -hmm. to disagree with mm -hmm. one another mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? One thing we would do is um, after the presentations, I would encourage students to have discussion questions that allowed them to have a particular question to focus um, their comments. And that way they could then develop an argument and respond to each other's arguments, not to e each other as people and say, yeah. it's not about you personally, it's about your ideas. 
and how what on what are you basing your ideas what evidence are you using you can disagree with someone and fully respect somebody but say I have a a view and I've read this that maybe you haven't read let me share that with you so we'd use the discussion questions as a way to allow people to have their disagreements and I would encourage them to disagree with myself I would say I I'd present a lecture yeah. I'd also pose questions as well and I'd say part of what you need to learn is, is to listen actively to look at the argument to, to, to listen to the argument and then say what is your reaction to it those are important skills and that uh, um, I hope we still teach in our classrooms and give people the experiences so then say professor I have a question you said X you said Y you said Z what about JK and F or whatever the topics were yeah. but it's the critical skills of learning how to understand an argument assess it and make your own commentary those are life skills you can use in any field of life crucial life mm -hmm. skills and of course Increasingly, employers are international themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they are actually global companies. While there are relatively small firms that wish to export their products and may well import. And uh, I think you've really put your finger on the crucial elements. Employers want what might be called cultural dexterity, the c capacity mm -hmm. to be interested in and get along with people of different nationalities, mm -hmm. different races, different mm -hmm. religions, different cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Cultural dexterity is mm -hmm. crucial mm -hmm. because it's crucial to the business's mm -hmm. success. They want people who know how to work in teams, mm -hmm. who aren't lone rangers, who know that most challenges these days have to be met by teamwork. They want people who can think critically, who understand that you've got to challenge assumptions, you've got to see if there's evidence behind them, you've got to be able to articulate the reasons for your positions. It's also really good for employers if people know how to write. Yes. at least in a yeoman-like capacity. Yes. Yes. And if they have command of another language, mm -hmm. wonderful. Employers are very demanding these days, mm -hmm. but what they want, so crucial to our success mm -hmm. globally in l learning how to get along globally, which we really need, how, need to know how to do. Mm -hmm. Are you worried these days about our capacity to get along globally, mm. one with another? Mm. I do. I remain optimistic despite the challenges before us that while um, at any given point there may be a, a degree of turbulence in international affairs, I do think there are connection points, ways for people to understand each other to try to solve problems, even very difficult problems, in systematic thoughtful ways. Now, that doesn't mean people will always agree. They won't. But trying to find the habits for talking through and addressing different issues is, in a sustained way is important and ways to help continue to enhance human well-being. And international education is one of those channels for that type of communication. So this is not an easy time. There have been difficult times in the past. There will be very difficult times in the future. But that's not to say that thoughtful minds, folk in a, that thoughtful minds working in a focused and sustained way should be able to address some of these issues. So I remain cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Well, we have to be optimistic mm -hmm. because the alternative is too grim. Mm -hmm. And I share your view that the more international education we have, the more students from America go abroad mm -hmm. and genuinely learn and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Students from abroad come to the United States. Uh, the greater our opportunity mm -hmm. to actually understand one another mm -hmm. and uh, actually care about one another mm -hmm and to avoid demonizing one another, the greater all those will be, and that will be good. 
Indeed, we very much hope. It'll be essential. I uh, know, indeed. Indeed, we very much hope that we have greater opportunities for students to study internationally. Yeah. Indeed, just looking at the United States, I, as you know, that although over 400,000 U.S. students study internationally, that many of them study in just four countries in Western Europe. Again, important countries with, uh, with which we have very well, important language is such a barrier for Americans. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So spreading the opportunities so that students travel to more countries yeah. uh, is important. We've talked about the importance of more students uh, uh, going to China. That's an important, uh, important yeah. step. Looking for ways for more people to go to more places uh, will be an important part of building that future. Uh, and one of the degrees, uh, one of the reasons I, could, I would yeah. be optimistic. And a necessary element is funding. Indeed, yes. Students can't go yes. abroad to study yes. without financial exactly. means. Exactly. And uh, it's important that mm. there be not just parents involved, because mm. sometimes parents mm. cannot mm. provide that help, but mm. need-based financial aid when, mm. it, when, mm. it, when it's necessary. And we're short on that mm. pretty much across the board. And NASA has been particularly supportive of looking for a way yeah. for additional institutional support. How can we develop mechanisms, whether for, through the federal government or through other ways, to provide support to institutions so that they can so help they can their students uh, yeah. uh, travel uh, uh, internationally as well? Because indeed, we have to say how to actually make it feasible and sustainable yeah. for students. Like everything else, it mm. takes resources. Mm, indeed. Well, Dr. Brunner, we thank you very much for this engaging conversation. We thank you for what you're doing at NASA. And we thank the Confucius Institutes for getting it together for this conversation and for what they are doing in the United States and really around the world. It's been wonderful to talk with you. Professor Everly, it's so nice to talk with you. Thank you. focus of this program is to recognize 10 individuals who exemplify the mission of the Confucius Institute. And that mission is dedicated to the teaching of Mandarin, the development of additional cultural awareness about China. We have 10 exemplary students representing the vast diversity of the students' body of Confucius Institutes all over the country. To all of the, uh, the honorees tonight, congratulations. You, you really, really, really deserve it. And, but it's not just your, your knowledge of, of the language and the culture. It's actually uh, the special spirit that inspires you to do this. And these difficult challenges that you've overcome in order to keep this going really require a certain quality of person to do this. If we in America are going to compete on the global platform, we need everybody in this room, and we need more than everybody in this room to be able to feel comfortable in a different culture, in a different context. There are not that many people who really feel comfortable in a Chinese context, and I hope that each one of you in this room knows how lucky you are to have a Confucius Institute as a bridge. People need to relate on a human basis, and when you feel comfortable human to human, people to people, you're gonna be a huge success. My mantra, my, my number one belief is that uh, there is nothing better than engagement. Uh, that, that's the way I live. If you are engaged in a common mission with the people with whom you work throughout the world, no one can stop you. We need everybody in this room. We need all of you to take your language and your cultural aptitude and your interest and to combine it with whatever other skill that you're doing. I don't care if it's accounting, I don't care if it's PR, I don't care if it's medicine. Put the two together and help the world connect. They are extraordinary young people and I'm very proud to introduce them to you tonight. Americans should learn Chinese because America and China are so connected in economy and trade and in our daily lives, China affects a lot of what we do. Having a strong relationship between these two countries is like is critical and to do so we have to be able to have these exchanges and not just amongst like 
the major leaders. It doesn't just need to be the presidents of both nations meeting. It needs to be the everyday citizens learning more about each other. The East and the West both have different values and both of them can combine to create something even more powerful. Both countries can benefit from each other and uh, China plays a large role in America's economy and culture. So it would um, help them fully, if they learn the language, it would help them with communicating further. Americans should learn Chinese just so they're not sitting in their little corner of the world. We could solve issues a lot better together by working together and learning how to communicate um, together as opposed to individually. So I think the sum of us together is way better than us to, uh, individually. Being involved in a Confucius classroom has really given me more of an understanding of not only a language but a culture and I've spent the past six or so years really immersing myself in Chinese from the classroom to the field trips to the music to the people and I want to major in international relations and a lot of that is because of the experiences that I've had in my Confucius classroom. I would just say just jump right in and start learning um, and you can do it especially when you have things like the Confucius Institute behind you. It's such a big world and such a diverse world and there's so much that at least for me we don't e I don't even know what I don't know and so by having educational cross-cultural experiences I, I think it helps us broaden our horizons it helps us deepen our understandings and it helps us build connections with people. Being able to visit China and speak to other middle schoolers entirely in Mandarin is something I never could have imagined a few years ago. It all happened because of my friends at the Confucius Institute at William & Mary College. I shared my experiences growing up in the U.S. and the Chinese students shared their experiences growing up in China. I asked them what they would like people in America to know about middle schoolers in China. Can you guess what all of the kids wanted us to know? Like kids everywhere, they all shouted out homework. <laughs> they said that they have way too much homework and not enough time for social and fun activities. They seem to think that American kids just have fun all the time. <laughs> this is not true, by the way. <laughs> so what I really want to do is raise my hand and raise a toast to everybody here and to say thank you so much for getting it. Thank you so much for being part of this and understanding it and to help us achieve what's going to be so important for the people that follow us.